Jim, let's get all the reviews out of the way. Let's see how much time we have left. AEW Dynamite this past oh, week. Oh, boy. Where were they? Do you remember where they were? Houston. Well, Houston, they, that's right. Houston, Texas. They were in a suburb of Houston in a building I've never heard of, but it was the greater Houston area. So let's, you know, clarify that. They were saying Houston. It's like when Vince, when Vince doesn't like they're in the suburbs and he just says, ah, f it, say we're in the New York area or whatever. But I understand they, we're, we're, we'll talk about the ratings, I guess, but I understand they bounced back from their drubbing last week to actually put up a number for this show that's better than by like 50,000 people than what they were doing before. And I saw somebody on Twitter or wherever said this, and it seems like it's true. Every time they do a good number, they do a rotten show. And then the next week, they might do a good show or for them, but they do a rotten number because people are like, what the fuck was that last week? And I, this was, this was something. Let's just hit the high points. The first match was Penthouse against Jay White. And I don't mean that that was a high point, but you will notice a pattern emerging here on the, on the uh, review as we go forward. Penthouse jump-started it before the bell with a dive out of the ring on everybody but his opponent. But then he got him afterwards. And then, did you, did you love, I know Taz is trying to, to do his job, even though they, they don't give him much to work with, and to come up with some way to not get any on him when this shit happens. But Penthouse runs and does a dive on everybody on the floor, and then gets on Jay White, and then throws him in the ring, and goes to the top and does a double foot stomp off the top onto Jay White, and then the referee rings the bell and drops down to count. So obviously it, it looked as if the referee had been bribed, but Taz said, well, it, it may look like the referee had been bribed, I guess, or whatever he said. It may look like a referee's an idiot, but the rules are that the match officially starts when both men are in the ring. Where the fuck did that rule come from? Is that a Tony Khan? Tony Khan. Okay. You will agree with me that this has never been a rule in any other professional wrestling organization ever, that regardless of what has happened, if somebody's been jumped on the floor, whatever the case, that the match officially starts when both people get in the ring and the referee can't has no discretion of, of whether that's the case. That's never, ever been a rule anywhere in the history of wrestling, right? I don't believe so, no. Okay, I just want to make sure. But Taz is trying. So, these guys can't fucking work. Penthouse is the shits. All he cares about is doing his stupid fucking mannerisms that get in the way of the fucking match. He has no logical idea of what to do or when to do it or how to sell it. And Jay White, I think, has been in Japan for so long that he's pretty much the same category. After a minute or two, Jay White just cut the guy off and started the heat. There was no healing him down or anything. Penthouse, uh, most of his selling involves adjusting his mask, sticking his tongue out, and waving his hands in the air. And then he totally, because he, there is no logic and psychology to an American audience to what he or any of the Lucha guys are doing. I'm sorry, it works there, it don't work here. He totally killed the heat that Jay White got because he started back on offense. And we've talked about when a babyface is selling and he fights from underneath. That's one thing. Or a hope spot. That's one thing. But when the guy completely takes over and begins offensive shit or ducking and running spots, then you've killed the fucking heat. And he just kind of made a half-ass comeback, and then Jay White stopped him again. And then did you see when Jay White tied his... Because P 
penthouse has the what are they? The fucking streamers or goddamn tassels? Uh, tassels on his mask. Jay White tried to tie the mask to the ring ropes, and it he couldn't tie a knot. And the announcer started joking about Jay White couldn't tie a knot because as soon as he tied the knot and let go, the shit fell off by itself. And I mean, this was shit. You could have tied these things in a knot. One would think that a full-grown professional wrestler could rip loose fairly easily. It's an AEW thing. Name one person in AEW who has made, who has successfully taped or knotted their opponent's hands. Or head. Yeah, or handcuffed. Yeah. Remember when Adam Cole got handcuffed and everyone thought he could just walk out of the handcuffs? <laughs> And then the other day, Omega got taped in a rope and they couldn't get the tape to stick They couldn't the get rope. the... If you can't work duct tape, <laughs> God damn it. It's not like there's instructions on the duct tape for people. And of course, they did the spot in the middle of the match where everything slows down, so after all the physicality, we could see who's really tough and I'll show you my chest and you show me yours. Yeah. And we'll slap each other as slow and as hard as we can because it's not a work anymore. <laughs> Well, that, that again, it, it, when White is beating on Penthouse, Penthouse is on his knees daring him to do more, so he did. And then Penthouse started to come back and did a dive, and then after the dive, he rolls Jay White in. He doesn't cover him. He stands there and makes his stupid fucking hand gesture and lets his opponent get up. And then stands there while White starts hitting him. And then he says, wait a minute. He tells his opponent, stop hitting me. I got to take my glove off. <laughs> and Jay White cooperates by standing there stock still and dumbstruck in the same place while Penthouse took his glove off and then turned his back on Jay White and threw the glove to Alex and then drew back and hit Jay White <laughs> right in the mush. And then Jay White turns around and just says, okay. And Penthouse stands there while Jay White chops him. And that went on and on. And in fact, I skipped ahead to the finish, which Penthouse hit some kind of weird move that I can't imagine is good for your spinal column and got a two count. And then Juice hit Penthouse with the TJ Maxx diamond ring that he's wearing now that took the place of the infamous roll of quarters. And Jay White hit his finish, one, two, three. So the challenger for the world heavyweight title can't beat this fucking guy without one of his cohorts knocking him out with a ring first and then... He didn't beat him with the ring. He then picked him up and hit his fucking finish. So it took the ring and the finish to beat this fucking guy. You fucking... They're idiots. They don't know how to be heels. Your thoughts? Yeah, not really the style of wrestling I liked. It seemed like the people there were into it, so we'll say that. But a lot of the... You mentioned before how in the middle of taking off his glove, he just turns around and throws it. There were a couple points, and again, I know it's not just him, but... Penta does the thing where his guy's down, so he turns and runs the other way as fast as he can. Yes. It's just, it's all about the cheap pop in so many of these guys' matches, and I don't like it, and uh, there's nothing else I could say. I don't know what else I could say. Well, we were 17 minutes into the program for that so far, and then I thought we were done, and I wrote, my God, he's going to talk now. And Jay White starts talking. It's a rib at this point that they are always in the longest segment of the show and it goes on forever and Jay White is out there blowed up and he can't start and then he's trying to cut a promo on MJF but he's even more whiny voice than normal because he's blown up and nobody wants to hear this guy talk and he's trying to convince the people that he's over rather than being convinced of it and speaking like it. And then Juice takes the mic, which was an improvement. And he's calling himself the stray bullet. 
instead of the loose cannon, the bullet club or the bang, bang, gang, bang, bang, whatever the fuck they are. I love the voice. I love the promo. I don't want to see it after 19 minutes of this other horse shit, but he swears that he's going to win the battle royal that they're going to have tonight for the shot next week at MJF's Dynamite Diamond Ring, and he's got an even better one, his cubic zirconium ring. So that was fine and got the point across, but now by the time he was done and we got those heels out of there, we were 21 minutes into the program. So, then Rene Moxley Good was in the back with MJF, and again, a well-done promo. He wants Juice to win, because the left hand of God is going to meet the right hand of the devil. And again, MJF is glib, and he's great, and he's natural. <sighs> Boy, it just doesn't have the... It doesn't have the oomph of the, the heel MJF, but... Now, I'd, maybe you can help here explain to me. She asked him to give an update on his friendship with Adam Cole. And as he starts to do that, here comes Max Caster and, and Bowens and Billy Gunn, the, the acclaimed and Billy. And they still want an eight-man tag team match. And Caster is pitching this. We want an eight-man tag match, us and you against them guys, and we'll, we'll win all the belts and we'll scissor afterward. And MJF said, no, I'm, I'm good. And then Caster suddenly goes from that, where he wants to team with MJF and help him, and he's his friend. Well, then what about if I enter the Battle Royal tonight and I win and I beat you next week and... Then you're going to have to, and he holds his hand out, and he says, put a ring on it. And is it my imagination, Brian, or is it my hearing, which we've established as going, but when he stuck his hand out and said, put a ring on it, was he doing a stereotypically effeminate voice that one would do if one was trying to appear or make fun of gay people? with his partner standing there who is actually gay and well thought of in the community. What are they doing here? Are they trying to piss their people off? Well, again, I think, to be honest, we don't know anything about Max Castor's personal life, so let's not make any assumptions one way or another. No, I'm not making I'm saying that is this bad creative that now Max Castor is having some kind of crush on MJF and is... Because nobody... MJF walks off on him, and then Bowen says, hey, too much, dude, and Billy Gunn says, that guy's a scumbag, but then Caster, with a face like in a sitcom, like at the break of Leave it to Beaver, says, yeah, but he's my scumbag. What are they trying to do here? Okay, look, it's it's bad, and it's bad, but it's good bad, too. It's good, <laughs> it's good bad in one sense. Apparently, and I... Mention this briefly, but I heard from some other people. MJF and Caster have been doing this online for years. Where Caster is like a creepy lover of MJF. And MJF wants nothing to do with this guy. So they are now brought it on to here. So if you're someone who's been following this on social media, that's what I said was the bad good. This, this is playing out. This is something that makes sense. Long-term booking. The problem is, I think they want to do something probably to heat up the acclaim that they need to, because they're they need help right now. And having them with babyface MJF on paper should be good for them. But the route they're taking, again, AEW fans will probably accept this and like it because they just want to be in on the joke. But it's whether it's a uh, a sexual thing or just a you know, creepy stalker thing. He has some kind of man crush on MJF. Single white male? I guess. But, but, and, you know, and you, you have to think, too, it's eventually... Why, gonna... why make your baby faces look like mental cases and like weirdos and creepy or childish or whatever they're doing? I couldn't answer that. I mean, again, this is not and, what and I would do to heat, heat them up. up. Heat up the acclaim by putting it with MJF, or are they going to 
put MJF in a block of ice by having him interact in this fashion with the acclaimed being silly. Again, I don't know. It's uh, It's been an interesting <laughs> series of booking decisions with the acclaimed ever since they got over big time, ever since that match where they didn't win the belts, but the crowd went crazy behind them. It's been a lot of questionable booking since then. Obviously, we know the end game is them teaming up with MJF, you would have to think, because of the way it's all building. Boy, somebody's going to look like Ned and the third reader, or, or Ned and the first reader, or whatever, If, uh, as JR used to say, if if they don't, but what? All right. Well, that those are my thoughts on that segment. Hikaru Shida wrestled Emi Sakura. Unfortunately, Emi didn't bring her mustache. And uh, by the way, Emi Sakura also jumped the girl from behind. So by the time that that was over, we were 37 minutes into the show. We'd had two matches, and both of them started with a jump start. Hold that thought. Renee Moxley Good was with Edge. And they did this in the back. I don't know. It might have been, it might have been better to do in front of an audience because Edge was incredible in this, I thought. <laughs> and, well, no, I, no, you don't yeah. like Edge. But no, because it's like he's doing it for James Lipton. It's 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 acting. It's clearly acting. I don't believe him. I thought it was well. It, it, here's the problem. He's a good actor. Then instead of the other droning on that you get from these people, and it, he at least delivered it like it was somewhat conversational. He had inflection. He put thought into it. That now he's decided that. His whole deal was to end his career with Christian Cage here in this in this toy land that they've made. But then Christian, like always, he went limber tail on the deal because he's always brought Christian along with him. He's always been the one to prod him. He's always been the one to do things first and bring Christian in on it. And apparently Christian has festered over it, and that's what's led to this jealousy and blah, blah, blah. And Edge says he's still going to be there when the dinosaur and Nick Wayne drop Christian. He'll be there to pick him up. He's not going to fight Christian. He doesn't want Christian's belt, and he's not going to fight his friend. So we've established that Edge doesn't want the match that we know sooner or later. We better get. Um, But I like this because he's better at, at this than most of these fucking indie guys that have never done television. I don't know. I, I don't see it with him. I just don't see it with him. And this whole thing just doesn't make any sense. So he's here to help his friend the dastardly heel <laughs> from himself because these guys are going to drop him like the Judgment Day dropped him. What? What? Why? <laughs> Why does that make any sense? Well, you can't go too deep now, Brian. Hey, you know, he used to be my friend. He's acting like a dick. He made some comments about my wife. I did not want to come here and fight him. Now I want to kick his ass. What do I got to do to get a match? No, instead it's, again, another guy. I'm here to help you from you. I'm here to be here for you when you need me. Well, now remember, Edge is the one that put together a group of heels called the Judgment Day. That's what I said, yeah. So maybe Christian is mad that he didn't get to be in the Judgment Day. And now, what's good for the goose is good for the Adam. <laughs> I guess so. Anyway, speaking By of... By the way, that wasn't, even, that wasn't even the worst acting on this show, though, to be fair. Oh, whoa, well, no, we're about <laughs> to get to that. No. No, we're about to get to that. Um... When did Wardlow uh, lose his spot and get fired and replaced on, on the AEW roster? What do you mean? He's been on the last three weeks. No, this is apparently they put Ethan Page on the gas. That's uh, He's taking the place of Wardlow. Re like, remember when the Ultimate Warrior died and they got a fake Ultimate Warrior and replaced him? Same thing. This wasn't Wardlow. This was Ethan Page on the juice. Why do you keep saying that? What, what do you mean? Because that's what he looks like. He looks like now. You, somebody said that on Twitter, and I can't not see it. He looks just like if you jacked Ethan Page up to the gills. Same haircut, same face, same beard or whatever the fuck. Same basic body type, just bigger. And the only thing they can figure out to do with Wardlow now is have him powerbomb people. And the referee stops it, but he only stopped it after one because they took pity on Ryan Nemeth. 
And, there, and Ryan Nemeth jump-started this match. That's three in a row. And then Tony Schiavone gets in the ring and asks Wardlow, why are you back? What have you come here for? What is your purpose in life? And Wardlow, in a stagey way, raises his hand so you can see, but even if you couldn't see, Tony says it, that MJF is written on his wrist tape. And then Wardlow walks forward and bumps Tony Schiavone with his shoulder, and Tony took a delayed action Ox Baker bump into the ropes and down to his butt and then just froze there, stunned and unable to comprehend what had happened to him. <sighs> what the fuck is this now? So how many people is MJF feuding with? Well, remember we, a couple weeks ago we were saying, who the fuck do we want to see MJF defend against? And now apparently Tony's answer is going to be, well, I'll just make it everybody so you can pick. Samoa Joe, Wardlow, Bullet Club Gold, mainly two people, Juice Robinson, Jay White, so there's four people. Roddy Strong, maybe, I think. Well, we don't know how that thing's going to be. Omega? Who was... the <laughs> yeah, oh, okay, they're teasing that here in a second. But who was in the devil mask that beat up Jay White a few weeks ago? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. I don't know. Anyway, so Renee Moxley Good was in the back with Twinkle Toes. And he's talking about his match later on tonight with good old Kyle Felcher. And the thing about thing about old Harpo there, old Kenny, is whether the match is important or not, he's gonna have the same tone the phone sex voice that he blathers on in, and he's going to talk about how my win-loss record hasn't been very good lately, and I hope to do well, or whatever the fuck he's saying. But after he gets even with the Don Fallis family, he's going to go after the world heavyweight title, which naturally brings MJF in, because he's obviously been standing 15 feet away waiting for his name to be mentioned. Because how else could he get there that quick? And he puts Twinkle Toes over and shakes his hand and then leans in and whispers, 13 days, bitch, in Kenny's ear and, and then says, good luck, and walks off. And Kenny's like, well, we'll see about that 13 days. Now, I wouldn't have known again what the flying fuck they were talking about Except that, again, somebody on Twitter said, well, in 13 days, MJF will have been champion longer than Kenny was. So I guess that's the bone of contention there. So it'll be interesting if they do do that match, I said do-do, to hear... I mean, some people are, are still going to cheer for fucking Harpo because some people as we've established, like that kind of thing. But the people who like MJF are obviously not only bigger wrestling fans, but more intelligent. And I can't wait to hear in what various ways they roast old Twink out of the fucking building in that match. Hey, let me ask you about that match, MJF versus Omega. Is that a match that you would rather use to pop a number potentially on TV, or do you think it should be a pay-per-view main event? Well, that's hard. I, I, if the pay-per-views are going to probably do within the same range of 30,000 buys one way or another. Well, it's that's the thing is normally you would think, I'm not putting that on a, a pay-per-view main event, except their pay-per-view audience specifically likes that kind of thing. So I might consider putting it on pay-per-view in AEW just because if anybody anywhere is going to buy anything that Kenny does, it's going to be the AEW fans. But having said that, the, the only thing I think they got to watch out for is they can't risk MJF looking like an idiot stooging for all of that fucking video game bullshit whether it's going to be the flipping dive over the top, is MJF going to have to catch this goof all by himself and risk injury? Or are they going to do some other bullshit where people get dropped on their heads? The antithesis of an MJF match is a Kenny Olivier match. So 
they better go with the champion calling this fucking thing or it's not only going to be the shits and make no sense, but there's an element of risk of injury to their golden goose from having this fucking human artichoke land on him. No, if Kenny doesn't insist on just doing everything his way, it could actually probably be the best Kenny Omega singles match we've seen in a very long time. Possibly ever. Of course, that's a low bar again, but nevertheless. But again, to my earlier question, whether it's Omega or someone else, what about the idea that the world champion's in this position where, do you think it's good or bad, where there's multiple people either currently having issues with him or wanting a title shot, so that's no the issue? It's great that there is multiple people having an issue with the world champion, that's what Dusty did. That's what Eddie Graham did. That's what Bill Watts did. But you don't go from none to 12 in three weeks. It, it, there should have been a staggering, uh, ascending level of all of these interactions that everybody wants the fucking guy that's the champion. And MJF can actually, he could be a little bit harder heel-edged than he is being right now just because he's in a position where everybody from both sides of the fence is out to get him. So he would have to take care of himself a little bit more than trust other people, but he's going the whole, I'm just, I'm your scumbag type of route. Anyway, 13 days, bitch. Well, we will see what happens in 13 days, but to your point about Omega's talking and his voice and the way he does his promos, Perhaps there would be a way to listen to something different while he's talking. So you don't actually hear his voice. You hear something a little rougher, a little gruffer, a little tougher. Like a Damien Priest kind of voice coming out of Omega's mouth. I don't know how you would sync all this up, but if there was a way, you could listen to how it about, on your Raycon earbuds. This? How about if we could have Kenny Olivier lip sync the words and like in The Exorcist, have Mercedes McCambridge do the voice? What do you think about that? Or maybe that with your Raycon earbuds. You know, the thing of it is, Brian, you can take these Raycon everyday wireless earbuds and stick them in your ears, and it will sound better than Kenny Olivier, even if you don't turn them on. Because they're good earplugs. If there's just somebody droning on and on, and you don't want to listen to them, shut up, I know there's a line there. Just stick the Raycon earbuds in your ears. You don't even have to turn them on. You'll get perfect silence, because they're not only quality earplugs, but also they can deliver fine quality, high quality audio because they've got great battery life and thoughtful features, a perfect in-ear fit. None of that nattering of Kenny's whiny, nasally voice can, can permeate around the, the vacuum seal that these earbuds make so that all you hear is the music, the symphonic sounds of Beethoven and Tchaikovsky and chop your cock off, and all the Russian composers. You will be as aware of your surroundings as you choose to be. Well, that's because they got the awareness mode. On, uh, you just hit the button, and boom, and you're aware of things like that. It raises your consciousness. And also, like I said, the vacuum seal in-ear fit. You know, you might ought to go ahead and wear these to bed, because then the earwigs couldn't crawl into your ears while you're asleep and defenseless. I wouldn't even, if I'd have known about the everyday earbuds when I did, I wouldn't even have had my custom ear snoods made to keep bugs from crawling into my head at late at night. I could have used the Raycons. But you can listen to your rock and roll. You can listen to your country and western. <laughs> Is that right, Grandpa? That's right. You, you listen can to listen your rock to, and your, roll? to your podcasts and your stories. You can listen to uh, the guiding light as the world turns, as the stomach turns, as, as, as your stomach churns, you can listen to anything you want to. You can be aware or you can be oblivious. It's all at the touch of a button. You can go high. You can go low. You hit the right button. These things will levitate you right over the goddamn roof. I'll tell you what. And did you know, Brian, that Raycon is having a big anniversary? They're turning six years old. And that that's almost as old as Beaver Cleaver was when he began starring in his own television program. Well, how old was he season one? He was about seven years old. Almost as old, okay. Almost, see? But right now, I'm telling you, you don't have to wait for another year because Raycon, they're not minors anymore. They've reached the age of maturity. 
And they've expanded their entire business with the introduction of Raycon Home and Raycon Power Tech. See, Raycon builds these homes, and then the Power Tech comes in and and puts power technology in them. I don't think that's how any of that works, but they're wonderful earbuds. And, and, and they're a wonderful company that makes these earbuds. And to thank everyone who has shown them support in the past six years. Because after all, what would they be without their supporters? They'd be droopy, dangly, and drippy. Raycon is offering 20% off everything on their site with select products up to 40% off. Now, we have done this math in the past. And we have analyzed this. And we have figured out that if you take 20% off everything on the site, but then you take 40% off of some of the select products. We have not well, figured then, this out, no. Well, no, no, I did. Then if you average all that out and you get one from column A and one from column B and a couple of other items, your average is going to be 36.7% off on everything. So right now, celebrate the biggest sale of the year, the sixth anniversary of Raycon. Go happy right birthday. Now. Happy, well, happy anniversary. They weren't really born as much as they were formed. They were, they were inaugurated. They were incorporated. They weren't just, they weren't just hatched. There was no sperm involved, Brian. So if you were going to post, if you were just a major fan of Raycon and you were going to post something on social media, you would say happy anniversary, Raycon? Happy anniversary. Not happy birthday, Raycon? Well, Six no, years because it says right here on the copy they sent us, Raycon is celebrating their anniversary. Doesn't say a goddamn thing about birthday. I take back the happy birthday. Raycon's anniversary, right here. It's on the on the copy. Well, happy anniversary, Ray. Well, and you you don't just gotta call him Ray. But right now you can call him on the on the website buyraycon.com. That's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N buyraycon.com slash J C E and use the code birthday. The code is birthday. The code is birthday. For the record, I don't know what that dramatic pause was there. I realized that you had some semblance of a point. <laughs> but if you comb your hair right, nobody will <laughs> notice it. So anyway, for their anniversary, go to <laughs> buyraycon.com slash JCE and use the code birthday. And don't ask me why the code isn't anniversary. Probably because Brian Last is involved. Wait until that big Christmas sale with the promo code Independence Day. <laughs> yeah, or Thanksgiving. <laughs> Festivus. Ladies and gentlemen, anyway, buy Raycon.com slash JCE. Use the code birthday. You're going to get 20% off to 40% off, depending on whatever it is. Code birthday for the anniversary at buy Raycon.com slash JCE. That's right, slash JCE, fine earbuds, but we're slashing through dynamite with this review, and there's still the big segments to come. Well, Adam Cole is still at Roderick Strong's, and they treated us to Mike Bennett playing the bongos like a madman. Uh, Cole was getting Roddy coffee. Cole's getting frustrated. He really needs to go get this surgery. Roddy asked for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Hey, Adam, you know, when we were in Ring of Honor, the one thing you used to do that everybody loved was make everybody peanut butter. And so now they're retroactively going back 10 years to make people look like uncool dicks. It's not just that they're uncool dicks now. They've always been uncool dicks. And they're, even though they were grown adults then, the way that they had fun was to make each other peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So they did a slow-mo peanut butter and jelly sandwich making montage with really bad music. And then Roddy got pissed because Adam Cole didn't trim his crust off. And Adam got pissed and said he was going to get his surgery. It's too long overdue and he's got to go. And he left in a huff. I think whoever's writing this shit is huffing something. And then Roddy told the other two buffoons, well, I guess I'm going to have to be nice to the scumbag to get my friend Adam back. And of course, he's revealing these, these plans on the air on national television. This I hate all these it, people now. It keeps getting worse. Yeah, we I hate can't all like of them. anybody involved. No, I don't want to see any of them on the show anymore. Uh, 
So, I hate anyone who likes these segments too. Yes, I, no, I hate anybody, anyone involved with these. Segments. I hate anyone who has the same name as anyone involved in any of these segments. I hate all Adams, all, all Mikes, all Mats. There's not a lot of Roddies, but we still don't like them. All right, well, Tony Schiavone was in the ring, and he, now he is so disgusted by Don Fallis and his family that he spits in the ring before he says Don's name. Can we please stop with, again, yes, you always have a babyface leaning announcer and a heel announcer in, in modern wrestling, and usually the babyface announcer is the straight one. He's the one that acknowledges people who cheat and admires people who don't, and otherwise he plays it straight, and then you have a heel announcer that obviously favors the heels because he's one of them. But you do not have a babyface announcer who constantly, when MJF was a heel, that no good prick, or spitting before you speak the guy's name, he's got to, in some way, you can be inflamed by a guy's action in the moment, as an announcer, but what the fuck, right? It's just, are they trying to give Tony personality or what is the, that's the only thing he's ever been good at is standing there and holding the mic and not having personality. That was his best job quality in wrestling. It wasn't as a commentator, certainly not since 1990. It was just standing there and doing that professionally. But now he's like a character. He's like grandpa Tony. And I know he did baseball. He's been a legitimate sports announcer. In minor league baseball. Well, it's still baseball. It's it's not a work, is it? Or you'd know better than me. It's not a work. No, no, no. It's all right, the, then he did the legitimate sports. So we ought to be able to know how to. All right. Well, you're not. But that doesn't mean he's good at it. That's what I'm doing. Well, something he ought to be good at it. Know, are two different things. He ought to know that the announcer shouldn't be the one taking the sides to the extent of spitting at the mention of the heel's name. All right. Nevertheless, the Fallis family in the ring, Don and Hobbs and our friend take a shit. So Don was crowing about Hobbs beating Jericho last week in such a convincing fashion, and then Hobbs gets the chance to talk. I'm thinking, okay, now he's in the top heel group, and they're going to let him do promos. And he gives us the backstory of why that he handed Chris Jericho his, his own ass last week, just beat the shit out of him. And that story is... <sighs> By the way, Hobbs is a legitimate son. Remember when they first started the company, he told the story he was a witness to his brother being shot, I think killed, definitely shot. He's grown up in the hood, disadvantaged upbringing. You could make the case, here's another goddamn badass like a Butch Reed or, you know, whatever the case. <laughs> How much hatred and animosity has he got built up against society over the various, you know, incidents that have happened in his life? And this is why he's mad at Chris Jericho. On February 2nd, 1998, he had a chance to meet his hero, Chris Jericho. Now, for one thing, God damn it, if a black kid's growing up in the fucking hood in 1998, would his hero have been Chris Jericho or Snoop fucking Dog? Well, if he's a wrestling fan, it'd be Chris Jericho, And secondly, maybe. was Chris Jericho anybody's hero in 1998? That was before he started with the WWF when they were just using him as a flunky down in WCW. Well, nevertheless, the, the point is, here is his story. This is why he beat up Chris Jericho last week. February 2, 1998, Hobbs had the chance to meet his hero, Chris Jericho, and his grandmother, who raised him, got him front row tickets. And Jericho, when he came out to the ring, told his grandmother to shut up and told Hobbs to sit down. And he was seven. And he swore the day that he got to look Chris Jericho in the eye, he was going to hurt him. He was seven and Jericho was a heel. 
Yes, and it wasn't a meet and greet. He got the chance to meet his hero by sitting in the front row. And of course, Jericho told Granny to shut up and Hobbs to sit down. But the point is, we're overlooking another thing. They've been in the same company for four fucking years. They've been in the same locker room for four fucking years. Why didn't he hurt him four fucking years ago? Does that make any sense? No. That's the story they came up with that the reason why Hobbs wanted to hurt Jericho, not to make a name for himself by destroying a legend, not to fucking show that he's capable of dominating anybody, no matter their, their pedigree or their experience or their reputation, not any manufactured legitimate slight that you would believe, but he cussed at my granny when I was seven and I swore I'd get even. They're making Hobbs. Look at the fucking beast. He's a goddamn giant. They're making him like a dickless little pussy fucking grade school child. It is funny if you think about it, though. It's like a sitcom. Like this little kid like, hey, granny, can you take me to the wrestling? Oh, sure. I got your ringside tickets. We're going to meet your favorite wrestler. And then the wrestler comes out. They start trying to have a conversation with him sitting at ringside. Of course, the heel said, leave me alone or whatever. Why couldn't Hobbs have said, you know what? In 1998, I was seven years old, but I loved wrestling and I wanted to meet Chris Jericho. And I couldn't afford a ticket because my family couldn't afford food. We couldn't afford rent. We were on food stamps. So I fucking, I didn't even have a bicycle. I fucking mooched my way onto a bus and then I walked through the worst neighborhood until I got to whatever arena they were at. And I hung out. All night, I could hear the crowd cheering all of the things that were going on, and I wished I could be in there, but I didn't have the money. And so I waited until finally the, the show was over, and the wrestlers started coming out. And I saw Chris Jericho, and I went up to him, and I said, please, Mr. Jericho, can I have your autograph? And Chris Jericho said, get away from me, you poor little bum or something no uh. one has no one has the motivation of money women success just arrogant like no one has any motivation beyond there was something that emotionally scarred me years ago and i want to talk about it this is now the second origin story we've gotten for powerhouse hobbs wait well, at least two but i like the first one better yeah i i watched my brother get shot Instead of I watched my granny get cussed out by a heel wrestler. One of these things is not like the other. Other than that, though, I will say, if you get past what he was saying, good intensity. And I'm not a Callus fan, but Takeshita and Hobbs standing there. Yeah. They're like badasses. Takeshita's great not saying anything. Just standing there and smirking or whatever you want to say it is. He's been great. And then Phallus did a halfway decent promo, putting Hobbs over a bit more than Hobbs put himself over. And then he mentioned old Kyle Felcher. He, he gave him a chance, but he screwed the family over by losing his match. And of course, that immediately brings out Kyle Felcher. Because now that the other half of that odd, visually disturbing tag team is injured, Felcher is a single. And... Apparently, Don basically says, well, if you can beat Kenny tonight, then we'll talk next week. So there we set up Kyle Felcher and Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang. And Kenny comes down to the ring and Felcher jump starts it. That makes four in a row. And what do you think of the promo going right into the match? I mean, not, I, well, not that they're the only ones who do it, but what do you think of them doing it here? It gets it over with quicker. There's something to be said for that. But I mean, no, but who wants to see this? I, and I knew even if it didn't last forever, it would seem like it. And so I skipped to the finish because I, you know, again, you can tell me, but I assume it looked like a video game where somebody had all the buttons pushed and just stuck them down and they just did everything until they were done doing everything. But the finish again, this, 
who are they trying to push and who are they trying to feature and you can't do both. And somebody's going, well, Kenny's always telling a story of his injuries and he's banged up and he's unimpressive as shit. And now he's taking middle card guys and having 15, 20 minute long matches with them with umpteen false finishes. So he can't even beat the middle of the card guys. So why are, he sounds like a, a twat. He looks like a confused member of the Marx Brothers, and he wrestles like a video game character. And he can't beat middle card guys without doing 745 finishes. Well, that's not exclusive to him. That's everyone in every match on these shows. But he magnifies all of those things. He looks more bizarre. He sounds more wimpish. He does more of the video game mannerisms. He excels in all those categories of shittiness. Yeah, at least he's gassed up a little bit and he looks the part, you know? Like, at least the other guys are just really skinny and need to go but, to the gym or something. But he, uh, Kenny could be six feet seven and 350 pounds and cut like Luger, and because of his demeanor, he wouldn't be intimidating. You know, Fletcher was interesting when he got in the ring with the other heels for the promo. Although skinny and he looks really young, really young. He's taller than Hobbs. He was taller than everyone in the ring. Yeah. He was taller than everyone. And Callis and Takeshi are what, like 6'2", 6'3"? I and mean, that was a, another point that why the fuck put the guy taller than Hobbs in there face to face with fucking Hobbs? And, but at the same time, this guy looks like a juvenile delinquent. But anyway, the finish was Twinkle Toes hit him with three finishes in a row. And then got a two count. And then another knee lift and went for the one-winged fairy. And Felcher came out of it and got a choke on Kenny. And Kenny rolled out of that. And they went back and forth with some Western swing dancing. And then Felcher hit a super kick. And then launched into a crisscross. I don't know why. And Kenny hit a knee lift and the one-winged fairy. One, two, three. It just, it, it was, I don't know. But there you go. Any further thoughts on that? No, not really. Not really. Let's have a further thought on this. They come back from a break, and the first thing you see is Lance Archer, who we haven't seen in forever, coming through the entranceway, and they're still doing the thing where if he has a match against a job guy, he comes through the entrance beating up the job guy. Well, it's not just a job guy. Remember, he used to come out like he pushed a cameraman or whoever, like a hand backstage, just anyone he would get a hold of, he would throw them right through the entranceway. Well, and it, and it ain't got any better. And in this case, they're incorporating some of their comedy into it because as he's beating the jobber down the ramp, Smiley Roberts is in the ring doing the ring introductions, and he's, he, he actually says, now kicking his opponent to the ring, Lance Archer. Does Lance Archer realize how phony and stupid and minor league and indie and outlaw this looks? Does he realize that it makes people laugh at him rather than be impressed by his physicality or whatever the fuck he's doing? It's all a joke. So the jobber rolls in. So this was a jump start, by the way, number five in a row. But the jobber rolls in and hits the ropes in the ring and di does a dive back out onto Lance Archer. And Archer is supposed to catch him by the goozle pipe and choke slam him. But he missed him. He just kind of pawed his face and the guy fell <laughs> in, at his feet. So the jobber rolled in and did it again. And this time he caught him. And choke slammed him. And then Aubrey Edwards rang the bell. I know you're saying, nay, it can't be true. But again, the same thing on the program as they did previously. A jump start, a fight. And when the guy is fucking down and hurt, then the referee rings the bell to start the match. And of course, Archer beats the guy. But what... <sighs> How would that be allowed to happen ever anywhere? You can, yes, you've seen angles where guys, top guys, 
are so anxious to get at each other that they spill into the arena fighting, but they don't have a... Then ring the bell and start the fucking match. It's a goddamn angle. It's fucking schmoz. It's chaos. And there's no reason to beat up the job guy. And if he does beat the job guy beforehand, then why would the referee start the fucking match? It's like AEW a few years ago. We get a Will Hobbs origin story, Lance Archer destroying a jobber on the way to the ring for a match, and then Wardlow doing the same thing in his match, just destroying someone. We've seen all this before. I will. I'm glad they've got new ideas. So, Swerve has done a music video. Actually, it's a rap video, so it's not music. But Nana... That's ridiculous. Finally, it was, I know, I agree. Rap is ridiculous. Rap is music, and you know it. Oh, come on. Prince Nana finally got a chance to do a promo. And he was excited... But Swerve isn't happy because a hangnail page, now it's personal. Apparently, we're going to have to watch that again. And, but Swerve did a good promo, and, and like I said, Nana finally got a chance to talk. But on the, we were an hour and 20 minutes into this program by now, and holy shit. Apparently, all this is that Will Washington. You know that, remember we heard a big deal about them hiring him, Will Washington? Will, you was mean Will in. Wheaton? Well, they were bringing this guy in who had a podcast that Tony Khan liked. He liked his yeah. opinions, and he brought him in. I asked someone, I said, what has he done? He goes, well, the only thing really is the swerve stuff, but that's his cousin. But if you like the swerve stuff, that's him. Wait a minute, they, wait a minute, they hired a guy for the booking team, and it's swerve's cousin? Yeah, he swerved, apparently, that's what I was told, he's swerve's cousin. That has a podcast. But if you like the swerve stuff, he's partially responsible for that stuff. Okay. Well, let's talk about who's partially responsible for the next segment, which was the one that made the news of if anything on this program did. And that was the interview and the segment with Sting. And should we should we give a spoiler alert at the top? The the gist of this, and we'll talk about it, was that Sting has announced when his retirement will be. He's going to retire at Revolution 2024. That's going to be his last match. What month of the year is that in? What when do they do Revolution? You know, they never Anybody said say? That. Yeah, they never said that on the pay-per-view. I'm looking. Uh this year it was in March. It was March 5th. Shit. So he may only have six months or thereabouts, not even. <sighs> Tony Schiavone was in the ring this time. He gave him a big introduction, not like Don, but uh, gave him a big introduction, how much it means to Tony to introduce this man from all the years, history they've had together. This is Sting! And Sting comes out, and after he's, after Tony has given him this big introduction and how much Sting means to him, Sting takes the microphone and and Tony fucks off and doesn't even stand there and wait to do any part of this. But now I know why we never let him talk too long. I actually knew that beforehand, but it was driven home here. The people love him. He's an icon. This was brutal. It was a newsmaking the thing to say the least, Sting has been a wrestler since 1985. That would be be 39 years at in 2024. One of the biggest stars in the history of the modern business. He's going to retire. I felt I had to watch this out of respect, but gee, many Christmas, the wandering around and the Sting has never had a great promo voice to be you know to lay down the law or to swear revenge or whatever he would when he was young and he had the body and the hair and the howl oh, and it's showtime and the energy that carried it but having to having to give a long or detailed explanation having to have something flow kind of naturally and or logically going a long period of time in his own particular monologue, these are n not and have never been 
Sting's strengths, and I get they put him out there to kind of say what he had to say and what came to him, and it seemed like a lot of it was coming to him off top of his head. But that was the 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 bottom line. Uh, Revolution 2024 will be his last match. He mentioned the word retirement that he wasn't going to mention <laughs> about 500 times. And his go-home line was potentially as flat a go-home line as I've ever heard. Because he had made a point in his promo of saying what he said in his Hall of Fame and his previous retirement or whatever. The one thing for sure about Sting is nothing's for sure. And his go-home line here was the one thing for sure about Sting's retirement is it's for sure. It was a 10-minute segment, and it felt like 30 minutes. And uh, please tell me if I'm overstating this case. I mean, yes and no. He's not a skilled talker. And, he, and when I say that, I mean he doesn't put together a coherent story. Whatever he's saying, there's no beginning, middle, and end. There's no, I'm going this way. It's just free form. I'm going to throw out names and... I mean, it was another retirement speech. Which and I it was, and it, it worked for Sting in any... Yes, he blessed, you know, Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan and all the people that helped him, but it was... It, Sting, as a young guy, was wild and crazy and chaotic, and he could get away with being all over the place. But now it's like he's kind of just rambling, right? Well, what I was going to say is I thought he was rambling. And this isn't the first time we've seen something like this from him. This is this is Sting. He's never he's not going to turn into a great promo now. But with that said, the fans didn't chant boring. They hung on his every word because you could tell it was going somewhere. Yeah, it was just taking he he had a process to go through to get there, and it was a forgiving audience because he is a legend, and I think a lot of people figured out this may be the beginning of his goodbye. Well, it had been leaked, rumors and innuendos and, uh, you know, whispers on the internet before. And the, and the way that he started it, they kind of figured something was going to go on. But uh, yes, they love him, and he got by with it. If it had been somebody saying the same thing that wasn't over, my God, they would have got the giant hook from a vaudeville show and jerked him out of the ring by that point. I mean, that's the only other thing, <sighs> I guess. I mean, knowing... How Tony Khan does things, I could see him just saying, say whatever you want out there. But if you're Sting, there's a retirement speech and then is announcing either a retirement tour or retirement, you know, it's like a celebration for the next several months. I'm not sure what it is, but he gave the retirement speech. Well, this wasn't necessarily, again, people liked it, but for me, yeah. I'm with you. I just thought it was just me. Well, and that's, a, you know, I can believe that Tony would tell some of these guys depend on who they well i mean he tells almost everybody that but especially the legends that he respects that he grew up watching as a fan oh just go out and do it however you want to do it that's exactly what you don't say to some legends in order to respect them to the level that they deserve because you have to be able to differentiate between guys that can go out and and say anything off the top of their head and make it gold, Mick Foley, and guys like Sting, who you should show them the respect that their name and iconic status should provide them by giving them guidelines, parameters, bullet points, things to say, not giving them too long, not letting them go out there and twist or whatever prepare a little something to help them get through it. And you got to know which ones are which. And Tony doesn't. He assumes everybody he looks up to and was a fan of is the greatest talent in the history of wrestling. And that's why we get some of these segments. What should it be? You have months to build it up. It is a pay-per-view event. Should it be Sting in a main event match? Should it be Sting in the mid-card in a tag match? Should it be... A ceremony with his famous rivals in attendance? What do you think it should be? Maybe a little bit of all of that. If you've got five or six months, say, ladies and gentlemen, and this is where if they had somebody to speak for the promotion instead of Tony, because I don't advocate Tony doing anything on microphone or camera anymore, but 
say to ladies and gentlemen, it's going to be a celebration of the career of Sting. Sting has written down the names of three individuals that he would like to face before he closes his career out. And we're going to present those matches in various of our programs, whether live or pay-per-view, over the next six months, culminating at Revolution. And maybe he does the first two, and then something happens in the second one that leads to a an angle, personal issue, him and Darby one more time against so-and-so and such-and-such, -and -such, or whatever the fuck, the big match that has heat behind it for Revolution. And, you know, that way, and, and you say that Sting will be going on the tour to promote this so we can be on television and you can advertise him one last time, Seattle, see Sting, or one last time, Poughkeepsie, or wherever the fuck they're at. You're going to see him. He might not wrestle, but you're going to see him. He's going to be involved. It's part of his tour. And, and do a whole promotion around it. Make sure his last match is the hot one and the meaningful one. And, you know, again, he, he wins the first one. The second one gets thrown out some reason because of whatever you're doing. And then the last one, he and his partner win together. And it gives the rub to Darby, if that's who it's, or whoever the fuck it may be. But he's got to win, you think? You got to win the last one. But, it, but at the same time, I didn't say the last one was a singles match. If you advertise him in three, the first two are singles. He wins the first one. The second one is an angle with no finish. And the third one is the tag team match at Revolution where he and his young cohort prevail and, ever, and then they drop the fucking streamers or the balloons or the ice or snow or whatever the fuck. And that's a nice little... And that's just off top of my head. We could polish this if we had an hour or two. But something to promote the next six months. And every time you see him, whether he's wrestling or just appearing on television or speaking or do autographs or whatever, it's part of that retirement tour. It's special the last time in each of these individual locations. And then make sure you buy the pay-per-view. It's Sting's last match. It's not that hard to fucking sit down and figure out the basics. And then how do you plug it in? All right, well, let's uh, plug out and plug in. Should we, should we plug in T Tony Storm's new film was in picture in picture again? But then you talked about some really bad acting. And we got to that point. They had advertised a sit-down interview with Jim Ross and Nick Wayne and Nick Wayne's mother. And... They must have been suitably ashamed of it because when they came back from a commercial break, the announcers didn't pitch to it. They just went to it cold. And there's JR there, and he he's there with Nick Wayne and Nick Wayne's mom, who was called Nick Wayne's mom. She does not apparently have a name. It was never revealed. And Jim Ross, I think, realizing what he was in the middle of there almost never spoke. There was no interview. He was just sitting there with grump face on as he should have been while a teenage dullard and his Meryl Streep wannabe mother shit the bed with some of the most ridiculous fucking dramatic overacting. I mean, <clears throat> Nick Wayne's mother looked like she was the star of one of those TV commercials where a concerned family member asks grandma if she's prepared for her final expenses. Oh, well, yes, I made the phone call to Nationwide. But, I mean, she was into it like she was Betty Davis. But she performed it like she was Betty Crocker. And... The only thing she got out of Nick Wayne was that he did it because it was always about Darby. Everybody liked him more. And they, and I was jealous. It, it, it's like the Smothers Brothers. Mom always liked you better. So then JR is sitting there looking completely unamused. 
Every time Nick Wayne mentions Christian Cage's name, the biggest heel in the company, they're playing it in the, in the arena, and the name, the mention of Christian's name, the people cheer. And then the mother cries, and Christian walks in. They cheer again, and Nick is going to leave with Christian. So mom slaps her son in an arty camera angle where apparently as they got up to leave, there happened to be a cameraman sitting cross-legged on the floor waiting for the Dutch tilt shoot-up of the slap. And then... As Nick Wayne and Christian leave, they go out the door, the door closed. Mom runs after him. Oh no, Nick, don't go. Shane, don't go. Then there's the sound of a fight behind the door. And Nick's mom is going, oh my God. And the door flies open and there's Darby Allen beating everybody up. And they go back to the announcers. And the announcers stall until Darby and Nick get out the entrance way because obviously they were standing by waiting because this earlier thing was a pre-tape. I can't believe they had a chance to do this again and they chose to air it. And then they fight out the entrance way and then here comes Christian and Dino to grab Darby and Sting comes out to help and they did some awkward walk fighting. And apparently, Nick Wayne really got one of his teeth knocked out. Somebody dropped him face first on the concrete. And Sting got the scorpion on Christian. And just to add insult to injury of the whole thing, as Sting's got the scorpion deathlock about on Christian, Dino Douche, the fucking giant monster that he is, doesn't get in the ring and try to help him. He reaches in and grabs Christian's hand and pulls him out to safety, and then they slink off together. And that was that segment. The brawl is an afterthought. It's really about the acting. It was so horrific. Only made good because of Jim Ross sitting in the middle, clearly not wanting to be involved in any of this. Not wanting to be there. Not wanting to be in that zip code. The acting and then the editing of it. The slap, which looked bad her reaction to the slap, and then him instantly saying, you're dead to me. And walking off with Christian, who's in segments like this to me, he's over the top. It's one thing if you want to see him do a promo in the ring or at that media scrum, but I don't think when, anyone when, came when out when of the, this looking good. This was no, a bad segment. When the atmosphere is so phony to begin with, and then he comes in and does his thing, it's, it's too much. She has no name. We barely care about Nick Wanks. He's barely been around. Where, what and, and look and look at that face. Doesn't he look like one of the goddamn Darling Brothers on the Andy Griffith show? I mean, just fucking slack-jawed and moop-faced. What happened to A.R. Fox? What did happen to him? He turned heel, was a part of the attack on Nick Wayne at his home, and then he turned back babyface. Apologized. And then we never and, saw him again. And left. He apologized and left like you, like you should. When you've done something you know, wrong. A man of class, now that I think about it. A.R. Fox. Whew. No, but this was a all-time bad segment in terms of wrestling acting. And you kind of expected it would be. And they lived up to expectations. I guess that's the one positive I could say. All righty. Well, we've come to our main event of the evening. The Dynamite Dozen Battle Royal, where the winner gets a shot next week at MJF, not for the title, but for the Dynamite Diamond Ring. And they basically put a mixture of the people that you knew, the, the two people that might possibly win would be Max Caster and Juice Robinson, because that's been spoken about, and it would fit the angle. And then they just put a random selection of jobbers and hardy boys in the rest of the battle royal to fill it out. So you had Matt and Jeff Hardy in there with job guys. And Jake Hager. Has Jake Hager ever done anything good in any wrestling company anywhere ever? Well, he had fans when he was doing like that weird uh, white supremacist gimmick with Dutch back in the old days on WWE. How could he how could he possibly be any good six, seven, eight years ago and be the shits now? Is he regressing? Or was it just that it wasn't any good before, but it was the WWE, so they got by with it? 
Because he's the fucking shits, by the way. Have you noticed? I've never been a fan of his. Jericho's anyway, the fan of his. That's why he's there. Well, and he and he wrestles like one match every four months and gets paid by this fucking sucker. Poor, I almost feel bad for Tony that he is running the biggest Make-A-Wish program since the history of Make-A-Wish. All bad wrestlers. I wish I could make a lot of money for doing nothing. Tony, right there. All right, so... So obviously this is a battle royal and it's in the main event spot and I'm not going to watch it because it's a battle royal and I doubt anybody else wanted to watch it either. So I was going to skip to the finish to see whether they put juice over and what I hoped would happen or if Caster was going to come out. But I didn't skip to the finish because they rang the bell for the battle royal with 10 minutes on the air and 10 minutes was enough time for this, honestly. But at 10 o'clock Eastern, they still had Daddy Mac, Danny Garcia, Juice, Dustin, and Caster in the Battle Royal, and Dustin dumped Daddy, and Garcia dumped Dustin, and my DVR froze. So I have heard since then that Juice Robinson won the thing, but after this television program, I not only deleted the episode, I unplugged the DVR just to make sure that it wouldn't come back like fungus on a shower curtain um well mjf was on commentary yeah and he ended up going at it with jay white knocked him down got his belt back and then jay white hit him in the nuts took the belt back <laughs> and then juice robinson pulled out a ring used it to win the battle royal while Did he, he put it on his finger put it on his finger then mjf took out his ring and they kind of showed each other their rings and now we're ready to put a ring on it for the big match next week. But Caster is still, he's, he's unspoken for. Nobody has proposed. Nobody has offered their hand to him in wedded bliss or whatever the fuck he's going for. I don't know what he's going for. But that was AEW, that was indeed AEW Dynamite and the Diamond Battle Royal, Diamond Ring Battle Royal or Diamond Battle Royal? Was it just Diamond? The, well, the, it was the Dynamite Dozen. Oh, Battle Royal to determine the challenger for the Dynamite Diamond Ring. The Dynamite Dozen Battle Royal gives you 12 minutes to turn off the TV and leave the room. <coughs> Ma'am? That was everybody's reaction. So did anybody watch this thing? We know they did a good number, but it had to tank at the end, certainly. Well, hold on one second. I'm pulling up the number. This is compiled by WrestleNomics. The overall number on average AEW Dynamite on October 18th was watched by 902,000 viewers. That is, to me, honestly incredible that they have put on these nonsensical programs for the last few weeks and still managed to muster. Was it, what was the tease? Was enough of the word out there about what Sting was going to do that they wanted to see that? Was there... Something else that we missed that was important here? Or they were just unopposed again and a lot of people skipped it last week and felt bad. Not like exactly they had sure. cheated on their, their spouse. Well, I guess the bigger question is what was the lead in? That and did anything happen there that would cause this number to be up? Because Jim, quarter one, eight to eight, fifteen PM. Penta El Zero Miedo <laughs> versus Jay White with picture in picture. One million, whoa, 1,000 viewers. Wait a minute, one million, 1,000. 1, I can't hardly write that. One comma zero okay. zero one. All righty. So they hit their magic million mark. Um, they, had, uh, they had a million magic marks is what they had. Where did we go from here? Well, that's why I now said. Now that all the children have grown up, and how do we spend our time? No one, nobody gives us a damn. And that is the highest I remember the opening number being in quite a while. Oh, yeah. Quarter two, 8.15, 8.30 p.m., the continuation of Penta versus Jay White. Bullet Club Gold's live promo. MJF and the Acclaim backstage. An ad break in the beginning of Emi Sakura versus Hikaru. Hikaru. <laughs> versus Hikaru Shida, <laughs> 931,000 viewers. Okay, we're, we're starting to get back to more 
realistic numbers here, but uh, 70,000, but for that, my God, you would have thought they'd run off more. Go ahead. Quarter three, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m., the continuation of Emmy Sakura. Now you're questioning now, yourself. Now, now I can't say anyone's name. Emmy Sakura, or Sakura, whatever name is. How about Freddie is. Mercury? Versus Hikaru Shida with Picture in Picture. Adam Copeland's backstage confession with Renee Moxley Good. It's my backstage confession when I tell the world that I love you. And speaking of grassroots, Wardlow <laughs> versus Ryan Nemeth in the post-match promo, 924,000 viewers. Ouch! They lost people for Edge? They lost people for Emmy Sakura versus Hikaru well, Shida. That's, yeah, that's true. And again, poor Edge, poor Edge was just caught in the crossfire. Hey, listen, Edge has so far, as far as YouTube numbers, he's caused a big spike in his videos for AEW. His segments have done okay, but until, you know, there's only so much slack they're going to give you before you do something. And it can't well, just you be know, the acting segments you want to do. It has to be what's right. We'll, we'll see. That that makes sense, though, because the YouTube segments, that's just Edge, and people can seek it out, and the WWE fans who liked Edge don't obviously want to or have to watch the rest of this outlaw program. They can just see the guy they like on the YouTube clips. So that makes sense. Yeah, and the thumbnail will feature him, who's just been on their TV show, so he's easily recognizable even to younger fans. Quarter 4, 8.45 to 9 p.m., Kenny Omega's backstage confrontation with MJF. An ad break. Adam Cole and Roderick Strong's continuing circus. The Don Callis Powerhouse Hobbs Kyle Fletcher live promo. 934,000 viewers. So they've gone 931, 924, and 934. So they're kind of plateaued there after the initial flurry at the beginning. What about the top of the 9 o'clock hour? Quarter 5, the big 9 o'clock hour. Kenny Omega versus Kyle Fletcher with Picture in Picture. And a Danhausen video. Oh, forgot about that. Apparently that's going to be some kind of ongoing segment. Love that Danhausen, so we'll have more silliness to make fun of. Imagine if they did that before he debuted. <laughs> Everyone gets like these packages after they have been there forever. <laughs> But 9 to 9, 15 p.m., 929,000 viewers. Ah, so they, they lost 5,000 off the... But again, 931, 924, 934, 929. Are they waiting for Sting? Quarter 6, 9, 15 to 9, 30 p.m. An ad break. Lance Archer versus Barrett Brown. That was his name. Swerve Strickland and Prince Nana's backstage promo. And Sting's live promo, 892,000 viewers. Oh, God, now apparently they weren't waiting for Sting because they bailed out before he got there. So, all right, I'm looking at the average, and they started with a million people, and they spent one, two, three, four quarters between 924 and 934. Now they've dropped to 892. There's a little bit more dropping to go to get to that average. What happened in the last two? In quarters 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., Tony Storm and RJ City's silent film with picture, in, well, during picture-in-picture picture ads, Nick Wayne and Nick Wayne's mom, interviewed by Jim Ross, and then Christian Cage comes in in the brawl with Darby Allen and everything else that was happening. Orange Cassidy and Chris Statlander's backstage promo. I skipped that. And an ad break. 861,000 viewers. Okay, so apparently the... Was it the... Uh, which segment was the Maxwell Silver Hammer here that conked the viewers on the head? Was it indeed the Puddin' Gang with Statlander, or was it indeed some of this other foolishness? Well, finally, quarter eight, and we do have a... Overrun, I'll give you that too with this. <laughs> Quarter eight. The only reason we got an overrun is because they can't get their shit in in the regular run. 9.45 to 10 p.m. The Dynamite Diamond Ring Battle Royal with picture-in-picture -picture ads. 
762,000 viewers. Wow. And five minute overrun, 836,000 viewers. Okay, and I think we've established that also the overrun was people tuning into whatever was scheduled next because how can a match who loses 100,000 viewers when the people see, oh, that's on, we ain't watching that, but suddenly it gets the last four minutes, they're going to pick up another 74,000? No, I think not. So they started the program with a million viewers and ended with 762,000. Mm. And that was AEW Dynamite, and... Congratulations to them that the people that were watching this thing had the patience they did before they dove off the cliff at the last half hour, because there was nothing there to reward their their interest or their patience. Well, Jim, perhaps Tony would look at the people in that first match, that first quarter, at Penta versus Jay White, and say, you guys got over a million viewers. I would like to reward you each with a gold coin. Well, he would be a sap then, because what got him a million viewers was the lead-in. But I'll tell you what he ought to be doing right now. He ought to be trying to preserve some of the wealth that has been bestowed upon him by his, his rich father. Because it ain't going to last forever if daddy don't cut him off because of everything that's going on in his life. Or when he has the nervous breakdown, Tony, and he gets committed to a rubber room at the puzzle factory, then his dad's going to cut him off, and then he's going to have blown a lot of money and preserved very little, if any, of it. And, you know, it's it's easy enough, Brian, to lose money in the wrestling business, but you can lose money in the stock market. You can lose... I know you will find this hard to believe, Brian Last, but you can actually lose money on collector's plates. You've heard the commercial. They even say it right out. Some plates go down in value. Well, you can't even eat fried chicken off of them anymore, for heaven's sake. But I'll tell you what you can do to preserve some wealth, to keep something back there in your in your little rainy day fund just in case you ever need it. When we talk about governments imploding, nuclear war, zombie apocalypses, most of the currency, let's face it, in the in the entire world is going to be no good because it's going to be dependent on the preservation of that particular government. Whoever issued that paper. We right? can't make any forward statements about currency domestic and abroad in the future. Well, you never, or when the, when the or, apes learn to speak, they're going to be printing brand new shit. Dr. Zayas? And, and it's going to have pictures of gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans on it. Cornelius? Cornelius and, and many folks like that. So, of course, it's going to be a completely different method of currency on paper. But you can always trust precious metals because what's the first thing that an ape with the power of speech and a long rifle is going to ask you when he's pointing that rifle at you with your hands up? He's going to say, hey, have you got any precious metals on you? Because that's what they want. So if you need to protect yourself from the apes with guns and the power of speech and have some precious metals to give them when they're holding you up, then you need to go and talk to the people at Nationwide Coins. That's what, I'm, I'm just telling you, these gorillas mean business. But Nationwide Coins sell government gold at cost. What government, you might say? The government that's going to be in charge when all this goes down. And... All new customers of Nationwide Coins will get their first ounce of gold without any dealer markup. And Brian, we've been talking about the gold and silver coins that they make, courtesy of their relationship with a former master of the mint, but they've also got pre-1933 American rare coins, modern American and foreign coins. They've got an array of precious metals products that you can buy to pass down in your family from generation to generation, unless somebody's firing blanks, in which case they skip a generation because they can't procreate, in which case there's going to be a battle amongst your descendants over who gets this gold and silver. So you need to start right now and make sure this is all in the right place. They've got precious metal consultants on staff that you can call on the telephone and speak to to help guide you to the right gold purchase for your unique situation. And Brian, you know why 
the American coins are pre-1933 because that's back when they had real gold coins that you could trust. Real gold. Do you know that the nickels are not even made out of nickel anymore? And we haven't had silver dimes for 50 fucking years. It's a goddamn crime against nature. What are your thoughts on copper? I think, as a matter of fact, I've copped many. Nationwide Coins is one of the nation's leading precious metal firms. And if, if you want somebody to copper, then they'll copper for you. They've got over 100 years of combined experience in the precious metals industry. I understand they have 40 years in gold, 30 years in silver. 20 years in platinum, six years in zinc, and three years in uranium with one year undecided. So right now, Nationwide Coins has thousands of satisfied customers, and you can be one of them. And they offer free shipping and insurance on all orders. And I'll tell you what, free shipping for gold. Do you know how heavy gold, Brian, gold Brian is? Do you, know, do you know how heavy gold is, Brian? That was my old gimmick. Gold Brian. How heavy Gold Brian is? Gold Brian is very heavy, but it, it it's no wonder that Gert Frobe and Harold what? Sakata, Gert Frobe and Harold Sakata, both of them couldn't carry all the gold out of out of Fort Knox because it's heavy. So they offer free shipping. You don't have to worry about that. And and just because the gold coins come by overland stage, courtesy of the Wells Fargo Stage Company. If you want to work with the gold standard in the gold industry, folks, for buying gold or silver or other precious metals or coins or things of that nature and all things beyond, go right now to nationwidecoins.com slash JCE and use the promo code JCE at checkout for your first one ounce gold coin at no dealer markup. Nationwidecoins.com slash JCE promo code JCE hoard that bag of precious gold which is heavy so when that ape points that rifle at you you can hit him over the head with the gold coin bag because that'll make a dent let's not talk about violence let's talk about putting these coins in a place well where the apes look deserve it when was the last time you watched planet of the apes i don't know why you're focusing on this that you know those warlike apes brought it on themselves did you see the remake they got more apes they remade Planet of the Apes with Mark Wahlberg like 10 years ago or something? Oh, fuck that. Exactly. If Charlton Heston or James Franciscus ain't involved, then I'm not going to be a party to it. But you should be a party to nationwidecoins.com slash JCE and use the promo code JCE and every bag of gold comes with a free nuclear fallout shield. And nothing for such no, an occasion. Don't promise things that are not going to be coming with it. There'll be no nuclear fallout shield. What there will be is the finest gold and silver and everything else that Nationwide Coins has. Check them out today. What's the promo code, Jim? Well, it's JCE. That's what it is. I said that before. And you said it again. I said it before. I'll say it again nationwidecoins.com slash jce